Miss O'Kaley here with another First Chapter Friday. This is one of my all-time favorite books. It's called Mockingbird, and it's by Katherine Erskine, and it is just a great story. It's about a little girl who has autism, and she is dealing with the aftermath of a school shooting and just kind of trying to figure out her feelings. And, you know, she processes the world differently than other people, and so she's trying to figure out how she feels and fit into to how other people feel and it's just it's a really a great book so again it's called Mockingbird by Katherine Erskine and I'm actually going to read the first two chapters of this one to you because the first chapter is only a page so we'll get a little bit into it so chapter one Devin's chest it looks like a one-winged bird crouching in the corner of our living room hurt trying to fly every time the heat pump turns on with a click and a groan and blows cold air into the sheet and lifts it up and it flutters for just a moment and then falls down again, still dead. Dad covered it with the gray sheet so I can't see it, but I know it's there and I can still draw it. I take my charcoal pencil and copy what I see, a grayish, squarish thing that's almost as tall as me with only one wing. Underneath the sheet is Devin's Eagle Scout project. It's the chest Dad and Devin are making, so he'll be ready to teach other Boy Scouts how to build a chest. I feel all around the sheet just to be sure his chest is underneath. It's cold and hard and stiff on the outside and cavernous on the inside. My dictionary says cavernous means filled with cavities or hollow areas. That's what's on the inside of Devin's chest, hollow areas. On the outside is the part that looks like the bird's broken wing because the sheet hangs off of it loosely. Under the sheet is a piece of wood that's going to be the door once Dad and Devin finish the chest, except now I don't know how they can. Now that Devin is gone, the bird will be trying to fly but never getting anywhere, just floating and falling, floating and falling. The gray of outside is inside, inside the living room, inside the chest, inside me. It's so gray that turning on a lamp is too sharp and it hurts. So the lamps are off, but it's still too bright. It should be black inside, and that's what I want. So I put my head under the sofa cushion where the green plaid fabric smells like Dad's sweat and Devin's socks and my popcorn, and the cushion feels soft and heavy on my head, and I push deeper so my shoulders and chest can get under it too. And there's a weight on me that holds me down and keeps me from floating and falling and floating and falling like a bird. You can feel the sadness in that. Chapter two, look at the person. Caitlin, dad says, the whole town is upset by what happened. They want to help, how? They wanna be with you, talk to you, take you places. I don't wanna be with them or talk to them or go places with them. He sighs, they wanna help you deal with life, Caitlin, without Devin. I don't know what this means, but the people came to our house. I wish I could hide in Devin's room, but I'm not allowed in there now. Not since the day our life fell apart and Dad slammed Devin's door shut and put his head against it and cried and said, No, 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 no. So I can't go to my hidey hole in Devin's room anymore, and I miss it. I try to hide in my room and draw, but Dad comes out and gets me. There are so many voices in our house, voices from Devin's Boy Scout troop. I recognize their green pants and the nice things they say about Devin. Voices of relatives. Dad introduces me to them. He says, you remember, and then he says a name. I say, no, because I don't remember. Dad says to look at the person, so I look quickly at a nose or a mouth or an ear, but I still don't remember. The voices say, I'm your second cousin, another says, wasn't it a beautiful memorial service? Another says, I love your drawings, you're a very talented artist, will you draw something for me? One even says, aren't you lucky to have so many relatives? I don't feel lucky, but they keep coming. Relatives we hardly saw when Devin was here, so how can they help? Neighbors like the man who yelled at Devin to get off his lawn, how can he help? People from school, Miss Brooke, my counselor, Miss Harper, the principal, all my teachers since kindergarten except my real fifth grade teacher because she left after what happened at Devon's school. I don't get it because nothing bad happened at James Madison Elementary. So why did she have to leave? Now, Mrs. Johnson is my teacher. She didn't even know Devon except she watched him play basketball, she says, twice. I've watched the LA Lakers play more than twice. I don't try to help them. Caitlin, if you ever want to talk about what happened, you just let me know, Miss Johnson says. That's what Miss Brooke is for, I tell her. Maybe we could all sit down together. Why? So that we know where we're coming from. I look around the living room and stare at the sheet-covered chest. I come from here. 
I'm sorry, I meant so we all know how you're feeling. Oh, Mrs. Brooke knows how I'm feeling, so you can find out from her. I would be, it would be superfluous. My dictionary says superfluous means exceeding what is sufficient or necessary. I just thought it would be nice to take some time to sit and chat. I shake my head. Superfluous also means marked by wastefulness. Well, okay then, she says. I suppose I can talk with Miss Brooke. Mrs. Brooke says that you can talk with her anytime because her door is always open. I tell Miss Johnson, actually, it's always closed, but if you knock, then she remembers to open it. Thank you, Caitlin. She doesn't move. This means she is waiting for me to say something. I hate that. It makes my underarms prickle and, and get wet. I almost start sucking my sleeve like I do at recess, but then I remember. You're welcome, I say. She moves away. I got it right. I go to the refrigerator and put my smiley face sticker on my chart under your manners. Seven more and I get to watch a video. When I turn away from the fridge, I see a puffy blue marshmallow wall in front of me. It smells of apple, cinnamon, pop-tarts, and breathes noisily. It's another neighbor or relative. I don't know which. Her hands are shaking. One hand has a tissue and the other hand she holds out to me. There is a white circle in it. Would you like this candy? I don't know. I have never had her candy before, so I don't know if I like it. But I like just about every candy in the galaxy. I don't like being trapped by the puffy blue wall like this, though. Take it, she says, and pushes it into my hand. So I take it just to get her hand off of mine because her hand is squishy and flabby and makes me feel sick. Have another, she says. I take it quickly so I won't have to feel her hand again. She tries to pat my head with the candy hand out, but I duck. I run and hide behind Dad and eat the candy. They are mints. I wish they were gummy worms because that's my favorite, but I deal with it. The good thing is I can't talk when my mouth is full because that's rude, so if I keep my mouth full, I can be in my own Caitlin world. When I finish the candy, I still won't walk, want to talk, so I push my head under Dad's sweater and feel the warmth of his chest as he breathes up and down and I smell his Gillette Cool Wave antiperspirant and deodorant. He doesn't even say, no, Caitlin, and pull me out. He lets me stay there and pats my head through the sweater. If it's through the sweater, I don't mind. Otherwise, I don't like anyone to touch me. Dad talks to the world outside the sweater, and his voice makes a low, hummy, vibrating feel. I close my eyes and wish I could stay here forever. So it's kind of a sad topic, this book, but Caitlin is pretty funny as you keep reading, and she has a lot of awesome moments, so... Mockingbird is a great read if you're looking for something new and fun to read. Hope you read it. Hope you enjoy it. Comment below. Tell me what you think.